Hi, I'm Dr. Marty Rossman for The Healing Mind. I've been a physician for 45 years, and I wanted to talk to you today about how to improve your sleep without drugs, how to get natural, restful sleep using methods that don't involve pharmaceuticals. First of all, let's talk for a little bit about sleep. What are the functions of sleep? Well, there's a lot that goes on while you're hopefully resting and not aware of it. One of the main things that happens during sleep is that memories get consolidated. All the things you've paid attention to during the day, uh, the things you've experienced, the conversations you've had, the things you've learned, whatever it is that's happened during the day gets sorted through the night. The brain goes through it, figures out what's important and what's not important. A lot of that is done by what's emotional and what's not emotional. A lot of the ways the brain makes decisions are by what affects you emotionally. That's kind of the function of emotions is to tell you what's really important to you. You know, if something doesn't affect you emotionally, I mean, it might be important like your 401k or some financial decision there. It's that kind of important. But in terms of being a human being on the earth, if something doesn't affect you emotionally, in a certain way, it's not that important to you. If it does arouse joy or love or happiness or even fear or anger or sadness, that means it's important to you on some deeper kind of a level. So the brain sorts through the information it's come, uh, come across through the day and it decides what to put into memory or not. That's why people who are sleep deprived and start having trouble sleeping, who don't get enough sleep or don't get good quality sleep, often start to have memory trouble earlier and worse than people who are able to sleep well. The other thing that happens during sleep is there's a lot of problem solving that goes on. Even though your conscious mind is, is gone in a sense and turned off, the billions and billions and billions of neurons in your brain are sorting through experiences and memories and putting things together in a way. So you may have had this experience, most people have. You go to bed with a problem you haven't been able to solve, you get up with an idea that helps you solve it or kind of put it together, or you have a dream that informs you and lets you know something important about that particular problem. Um, the third thing the brain does while you're sleeping is it does a lot of emotional processing and resolution. So it's able to kind of come to terms and resolve issues that have emotional components. And at the same time, the brain replenishes its chemistry. It takes nutrients from the blood. It reads informational molecules like hormones, inflammatory molecules, and so on from the body. And it takes from that stream the nutrients that it needs in order to uh, recharge itself and get ready for another day of activity. Um, Finally, the other thing the, br the brain does during sleep is that it does pruning and reorganization of the neural synapses, the connections between the nerve cells. You know, the, the brain works by tracks that connect various nerve cells. There might be two, three, four, ten, 10, 100 nerve cells involved in a certain pathway that's attached to certain thoughts or feelings or activities that you do. And while the brain is both replenishing itself chemically, resolving things emotionally, solving problems, and putting some things into storage, it also is pruning and taking out connections that it has decided are not really worth keeping. So a lot of busy activity during the day. At night, the brain does clean up, fix up, paint up, recharges itself, reorganizes itself to be ready for the next day. Now, sleep is a very common casualty of stress. There's a lot of sleep problems that are going on, and a lot of them actually have more to do with what's going on in the daytime than they do what's going on in the nighttime. And stress is a huge problem for people when it comes to sleep. We live in a very stressed society, a very stressed lifestyle, a lot of activity, a lot of ambition, too much to do in too little time, we take very little downtime. We have a huge emphasis on productivity and not enough emphasis on kind of chilling out and relaxing and letting the body go through these cycles of activity and rest that were really made 
uh, to live by, by nature. If you look at free living humans, or you look at our most, our closest relatives like the great apes, they're active for a certain amount of time. They have a lot of rest time. They have a lot of downtime. They have a lot of time with their families and their babies and their mates, a lot of social grooming activities, eating, a lot of napping, along with getting food and keeping safe from the elements and from predators in the jungle. So we don't live like that. We're on, 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 on. If we run out of energy, we crank it up with caffeine, caffeinated beverages or other stimulants. And we have lost the uh, ability to value and use the natural cyclic downtime that we need in order to function at an optimal basis. NASA did research on the astronauts, which are, who are tremendously fit physically and mentally. And when they were preparing to put astronauts into space, they did a lot of experimentation, like what happens if you don't let somebody sleep? What if you keep people on task and solving problems and doing complex calculations without getting sleep periods or rest periods during the day? And of course, these tremendously physically fit and brilliant uh, engineer minds that the astronauts have uh, were probably better up for these tasks than most of us who are just kind of in an average shape or less. And uh, what they found was that the, these brilliant people would function very, very well for about an hour. And then they'd have 20 to 30 minutes where they would continue to work hard, but they would make four to five times as many mistakes. And sometimes they didn't even realize it, that they were making those mistakes. And what they found was, is if they could organize their work into about an hour or so of concentrated, focused work, and then they could take kind of a break for about 20 minutes, that that was the natural rhythm of the brain. And they would end up being able to be more productive and more accurate in what they did for a longer period of time than if they just tried to power through and didn't take breaks. So we need to respect the need for a little more downtime, uh, which I'll talk to in a little bit. Um, if you skip eating, if you eat irregularly, you're going to throw your physiology into uh, some distress if you don't take those rests. And you can get into this period where your mind just wants to go on and on and on and on, and you can't turn it off. If you get into that in the daytime, especially if you're a type A or you have any tendency to compulsivity and you feel like there's just not enough hours in the day, it's going to start to bleed into the nighttime and you're going to lose the, your sleep time. So you're not only cheating yourself or cutting yourself out of these restorative pauses that we need during the day, now you're starting to cut out from your sleep time and your sleep cycles and all of those things, the replenishment of chemicals, the rearrangement of neurons, uh, the consolidation of memory, uh, uh, putting things, uh, sorting out your emotional kind of relationships, you're going to miss that too. It's all going to catch up with you um, and one is going to make the other one worse. It's going to get into a vicious cycle. Having a bad worry habit, just habitually letting your imagination run away with you and worrying over and over and over about uh, things you can't really do anything about creates a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety in the body and uh, turns up those stress juices in the body, makes it harder to turn off your mind. Again, these are these vicious cycles that become harder and harder to turn off. The good news is we can turn them off and you can learn how to turn them off and get those rest breaks, get those replenishment breaks. Uh, if you'll take the time to learn some skills and practice them, there's, there's hope. It's a good thing to know. People often ask, how much sleep do we need? Well, that varies by how old you are, if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you exercise and how vigorously you exercise and so on. So adults need uh, somewhere between 5 to 11 hours of sleep. Um, and most adults need between 7 and 9, so the classical 8 hours of sleep. It doesn't mean you need to sleep 8 hours. You might do fine with 7. You might need 9. Some people need quite a bit less. Some people do fine on five or six hours. Um, other people need more. They need 10 or 11. Again, teenagers and young uh, people in their young 20s are notorious for needing tons of sleep. Um, and unfortunately, we don't let them get the sleep we need to get them up in the morning. They tend to stay up late at night. 
and maybe that's when a, a bad habit starts. We do need less sleep as we age, uh, but if you're frequently tired or you're finding it hard to concentrate, you're finding it hard to remember things or solve problems, uh, check your sleep out. Are you giving yourself enough time to sleep? Are you able to sleep restoratively? Do you feel rested in the morning? Uh, and if you're not, something you can do that's kind of a, a, sometimes kind of a quick reset is to give yourself a sleep vacation. Just take two to three days and just let yourself sleep as much as you possibly can. If you're wired or tired, this can be a very, very useful thing to do. Even one day where you just say to people, I'm not getting out of bed today. Leave me alone today. I mean, sleep as much as you can. If you get up, read something. You can even watch some TV, doze back off. Two days is terrific. Three days, if people let themselves just sleep and rest as much as they can for three days, they can often break a cycle and get back feeling better than they did before. So sleep happens in cycles. Um, the cycles average about 90 minutes for most people. They might be as short as 75 minutes. They might be as long as 105 minutes. It averages about 90, where we go through these different stages of light sleep and then into stage two, deeper sleep. Stage three is deeper yet and down into deep dreamless sleep that's stage four. That's that really deep sleep where you're really unconscious and deep. And if somebody wakes you up in the middle of that, you have trouble recovering from it that day. You just feel like you're wrong all day long. You want to be able to get up when you're coming back up through the stages, four, three, two, one, REM sleep, uh, where you're dreaming and just barely asleep. You want to try to get up in the light part of one of those cycles. And we all have about four or five of these cycles a night. So something that I counsel my patients to do is to uh, just check out how long they would sleep when they don't need to get up with an alarm clock. You know, do you need six hours? Do you need seven and a half? Do you need eight? Whatever. Figure you have four or five cycles during a night and divide that time by four or five and see what you come up with. When you come up with something more or less 90 minutes, that's your sleep cycle. And if you time it so that you get up when you're at the shallow end of a sleep cycle, you will feel more awake, you'll feel more rested, you'll feel more on target. So for instance, my sleep cycles are around 90 minutes. So I know if I have a night when I need to go to bed late, if I'm working on something important or I'm babysitting a grandson or something like that, and I need to get up in the morning, I don't want to get up at eight hours, I want to get up at seven and a half because they're 90 minute cycles. So I can, get, um, I can get five cycles in in seven and a half hours, okay? And I plan to get up and if I need, if I don't have that much time to sleep, I go back to six hours because I am more rested and awake if I get up at six hours than I am at six and a half or 6.45 or seven because there I'm setting the alarm and I'm trying to rouse myself up from the wrong part of the sleep cycle, and that'll have a really poor effect on your brain functioning the next day. So figure out your sleep cycles and figure out that you're gonna give yourself, you know, whether it's three or four or five cycles, if you time it so that you're gonna get up when you're in the light part of the cycle, you will feel more rested and more functional. Now insomnia, insomnia is defined as, as trouble initiating and maintaining sleep that distresses people. That's basically what insomnia is. Um, a lot of times people have transient insomnia. If you lose someone and you're grieving, if you have a big crisis in your life, if you have a medical crisis, we can all go through periods of time when for two, three, four, up to six weeks, we can have difficulty sleeping. And that typically goes away by itself. We get balanced out. But chronic insomnia is, is insomnia that lasts more than six weeks. And the data shows that as many as 60 million Americans have chronic insomnia. It's about one in five people in America with chronic insomnia, so it's a big problem. And part of the reason it's a big problem is there is no effective medical treatment for insomnia. 
we give people a lot of drugs, but they're not effective. And as a matter of fact, some of them uh, are worse than that. They have side effects, they have dangerous side effects, or they actually interfere with people's ability to get back into natural sleep cycles. Sleep specialists hate sleeping pills. And they are desperate to look for something else other than sleeping pills. <clears throat> Conventional medicine doesn't have a lot to offer for chronic insomnia, and so and people get desperate when they can't sleep, so people end up, both because of their desperation and the desperation of the doctor to help them, they end up frequently on sleeping pills. So there are some causes of insomnia that you can do something about. One is what's called sleep hygiene. And this is how you set yourself up to go to sleep. These are the habits that can lead to insomnia, poor sleep hygiene. Things like um, working right up to the minute you go to bed, especially if you're working on computer screens or blue lit screens and you're filling your mind with things to do right up to the minute you're supposed to go to bed. Your brain needs a little rundown time. You know, it needs to, you know, if you've ever been to the drag races where these cars just go, you know, quarter of a mile in two seconds and then they pop a parachute out behind them to slow them down, they don't just do a quarter mile in two seconds and then hit the brakes and stop like that. It, our brains are the same way in a way. They need some time to wind down. When you're busy solving problems and thinking about things and multitasking and taking care of kids and doing work and trying to be in eight different places at a time, your basic brain cycle is probably in the probably something like 40 cycles per second or 42 cycles per second. It's working fast and it's working hard. When you put yourself into a relaxation response, a relax you're probably running about 10 to 12 cycles per second. You're still awake, but you're quiet and you're resting um, and you're not thinking about too much. You're probably about 10 to 12 cycles. When you fall asleep and you start to dream, you're probably at eight cycles per second or less. And then when you go way down into your stage four sleep, you're probably going two to four cycles a second. So your brain is just kind of just gently kind of working, you know, instead of, but when you're busy doing all that stuff, it's just racing like a race car. And you need to put the day to bed. You need to give it a chance to slow down. So if you can stop working even a half an hour, but even better, an hour to an hour and a half before you want to go to sleep. Um, and if you can turn the television off, maybe make your list of what you want to do tomorrow so that you don't have to carry it around in your head. And just start putting the day to bed and start putting your body to bed. Just like you start this process of putting a child to bed, put yourself to bed that same way. Uh, you're going to have a lot more successes. You slow it down so when you get in bed, maybe your brain's only running at 15, 18 cycles per second. It's easy from there to slow down to 12 or 10 cycles per second. It's easy from there to fall asleep. But it's not easy to go from 40 cycles per second to 10. And then what happens is sort of that people go to this default mantra in the head when you can't fall asleep but you're tired and you need to, what's the first thing that you say to yourself? Oh, God, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I'm going to be a total wreck in the morning. I'm not going to be able to sleep. I'm just not going to be able to get to sleep. I have people say this to them. And, of course, that's exactly what you don't want to say to yourself. You want to say to yourself, I can sleep. I slept my whole childhood. I know how to sleep. I'm going to relax, I'm going to rest. I'll fall asleep if I let myself. But the mantra for people who wake up in the middle of the night is, oh, I'm going to be a wreck tomorrow. I'm not going to be able to get to sleep. I'm, not, I'm going to be tired, I'm going to be cranky. I'm not going to be able to sleep. So we have to learn some mental hygiene along with the sleep hygiene. Other elements in sleep hygiene are things like if you have to work on a screen, on a blue screen, on a computer screen, you just have to work at night, get yourself some amber glasses. You can get them online everywhere. Orange glasses, they counteract the blue rays. The blue rays are stimulating to the brain. The orange counteracts it, and it'll help you relax and get to sleep easier. Things like taking a nice hot bath about 90 minutes before you go to bed, run a hot bath, throw some Epsom salts in there, or lavender salts, or pine salts, whatever is pleasant and relaxing to you. Take a bath, 
do some breathing, let your body begin to relax. You get out of the bath, your body core temperature is higher, and over the next hour, it'll drop about one degree. And the dropping of the core body temperature, which is what typically happens in nature at night, is one of the most powerful signals there is to the brain that it's time to wind it down, time to slow down, and time to fall asleep. So that's, that's something, especially if you like baths, take the time just to let everything start to wind down. The bath is a very effective thing that helps a lot. Manage your stress better during the day. We have a lot of resources at The Healing Mind to help you learn how to do that. Um, treat, you know, make sure if you're anxious or you're depressed that you're paying attention to that, that you're getting appropriate treatment because they can interfere with your sleep. And then look at your medications, um, medications that may be stimulating, uh, medications that may make you get up frequently during the night to urinate so that your sleep is interrupted. And even some of the maybe psychoactive medications that you're taking may interfere with your sleep as opposed to help with it. And then there's some medical conditions that um, sleep apnea, waking up at night gasping for air. If you have sleep apnea, get that treated. It'll help you sleep better. Restless leg syndrome, that is something that we have treatments for, medical treatments. And then look at your hormone balances, especially your thyroid hormone, your adrenal hormones, or if some of you ladies are going through menopause or perimenopause, one of the things that happen when as women start to lose estrogen is they will start to have more sleep difficulty. And you may want to look at possibly hormone replacement for a short time. And if that's not acceptable or uh, if you have risk factors that make that um, not desirable, I'm going to show you some other ways that you can help to balance that and get to sleep. People have this myth that I should go to sleep, I should sleep eight hours, I should get up in the morning, and I'm not doing that, what's wrong with me? I'm not sleeping properly. That turns out that that's a myth. And that actually, what's called biphasic sleep is actually a normal sleep pattern. There's a, a professor, I think, at the University of Virginia uh, named Dr. Urkic, who calls himself a sleep historian. And he studied how people sleep in, back in literature as far back as he could get, studied how other cultures sleep, studied how uh, more primitive or natural living uh, people sleep. And he found what he says is typically humans slept in two four-hour blocks, which were separated by a period of wakefulness in the middle of the night, uh, lasting for an hour or more. And during that time, some people might stay in bed, some people might pray, they might think, they might uh, even get up and talk with their, with their neighbors. Um, others might get up and do things and, uh, before going back to sleep. So in sleep centers, we often tell people, you know, if you're not sleeping, get back to sleep in a half hour, get up and do something until you're tired, then go back to sleep. That's good advice. Uh, again, a lot of people get up in the middle, they get up at three o'clock, and they freak out, they get anxious and start telling themselves, I'm gonna be a wreck tomorrow, I'll never get back to sleep. Well, that's the wrong message to send from your brain. You're gonna say, I'm up, I'll do something, I'll read, I'll watch a little television, uh, put the dishes in the dishwater, whatever. When I'm tired, I'll go back to sleep, because you will, and it's perfectly okay to sleep in two or even three blocks of time. The main thing is, are you rested when you get up in the morning? There's no other mammal on earth that tries to sleep eight hours in a row, and neither do so-called primitive peoples. So sleep hygiene is important. Exercise is a non, very good non-drug way to get back to sleep. Don't exercise in the middle of the night, and don't exercise in the evening before you go to bed, but make sure you get some good vigorous exercise. You know, tire yourself out during the daytime in a physical way. Physical exercise, there's a good tiredness that comes from it. You burn up a lot of stress chemicals. Whereas mental exercise or mental work it can be draining because you don't have the physical component that burns up those stress chemicals. Learn more about good stress management. Learn how to do a relaxation technique. Learn how to breathe from the abdomen. Learn how to use guided imagery. Make some breaks in the middle of your day a regular routine so that you're not wired at the end of the day and you're not 
Um, you're not so aroused and agitated from your stress physiology that you just can't turn it off. Then there's some herbs and supplements and things like acupuncture uh, that I want to talk to you about. Um, sleep hygiene, dark, cold, and quiet are the ideal sleeping circumstances. You want your room di dark, get uh, blackout shades if you need to. You know, turn off lights that you don't need. Turn off all the little lights on the, uh, on the t television and the computers and the VCR and so on. Let it be cool and make sure that it's quiet. Try to be regular in the hours that you go to sleep and regular in the hours that you eat. Exercise during the day. Use your bed just for sleeping or for having sex. Don't read in bed, don't do work in bed, don't do other things if you're just condition your body. This is for sleep or for making love. And don't eat a big meal and don't drink caffeine or even alcohol before you go to, shortly before you go to bed. Alcohol is notorious for letting you get to sleep, sleeping three to four hours and then waking you up and it, making it hard to go back to bed. So, along with the good sleep hygiene, which is very important, there's some natural sleep inducers you might want to think about using if you're still having trouble. One is melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone that your pineal gland makes. Pineal glands in the middle of your brain. And it regulates sleep and wake cycles by making this hormone called melatonin. You take it about an hour before you go to bed. You only need a little bit, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. I think a lot of people use melatonin the wrong way. And they try to use it like a sleeping pill to knock themselves out with it. That's not what melatonin does. It's a hormone. It sends, it's only needed in a tiny amount. Your brain normally makes 0.3 milligrams. And it sends a signal to the brain, it's time to wind it down. So if you take it regularly for about two to three weeks, and don't expect it to put you to sleep the first night, give it a couple of weeks so you're pinging your brain. You say, time to go to sleep, time to go to sleep, time to go to sleep, and give it a chance to start to respond to that regular schedule, you'll start sleeping much better. But a lot of people, they don't even sell melatonin in 0.3 milligrams. The smallest you can usually get is 0.5. Very often it's one or two or three milligrams or five milligrams or 10 milligrams, which is 30 times the amount that you need. And people start taking more and more melatonin. Again, treating it like a sleeping pill to knock them out. You need a little bit. You need it regularly at the same time and give it a little time to have its effect. Magnesium is something that a lot of Americans are deficient in. And taking magnesium, about 200 milligrams, three times a day or so, will, is very relaxing to your nervous system. Magnesium relaxes your muscles. It relaxes your nervous system. And about 60% of Americans are deficient in magnesium. And when part of the reason is that when we're under a lot of stress, we excrete more magnesium in our urine. So we need more of an intake. Uh, look up the foods that are rich in magnesium. A lot of them are dark green leafy vegetables and other green vegetables. Um, and increase your intake of those things. But you can also very safely take 200 milligrams of magnesium uh, glycinate or aspartate or citrate, uh, maybe three times a day. If you take too much magnesium, you can get loose stools, just like milk of magnesia is a laxative. So if you take too much, you can get loose stools. If you're getting loose stools, cut your dose back. Um, and you might just want to take it before you go to bed if that's your major goal. Another very useful natural product is 5-HT or 5-hydroxytryptophan which you can take 50 to 200 milligrams about an hour before sleep. Start with 50 milligrams. See how that works for you. If that helps but not enough, go to 100 milligrams. Again, you can go to 150. Some people need as much as 200 milligrams. But start low and go up slow and give it a chance to work. 5-hydroxytryptophan is very safe. Although you have to be careful with it, if you're taking an antidepressant, if you're taking an SSRI or SNRI antidepressant, you want to talk to your doctor or your prescribing psychiatrist 
uh, because there's a theoretical uh, danger of having too much serotonin in your system. 5-hydroxytryptophan is the precursor molecule to, to serotonin, which is the molecule that lets you relax, reduces anxiety, buffers your stress, and treats depression. So that's a very, very useful uh, molecule. Another amino acid that's very useful is L-theanine. Um, green tea, paradoxically, is very high in L-theanine, but green tea also has chemicals in it that are related to caffeine that are stimulating, so it's not an ideal bedtime drink. As a matter of fact, you should stop drinking caffeinated beverages probably after 4 p.m. if you're having trouble getting to sleep. But taking L-theanine, which is also very safe in the evening, 500 milligrams, Again, you can take that earlier in the evening. It's very calming, very relaxing. It doesn't knock you out, but it calms you down and it makes it easier to slip into sleep. Uh, same with L-taurine, which is a third amino acid that you might take. Uh, generally, it's better to take one of these, see how it affects you. If you need a booster, add the second one. And if you still need a booster, you can add the third. Um, GABA is a fourth amino acid. One of these may work better than the others. I find the 5-hydroxytryptophan is the most effective one, and the L-theanine is the next most effective. And then there's a variety of herbs that have long been used in European herbal medicine. Uh, hops, skullcap, valerian root, uh, passionflower, uh, chamomile, especially German chamomile. Uh, they've got some very nice calming and soothing properties, and there are a number of good quality uh, herbal medicine products. You have to know your brands. There are websites uh, that are hyping and selling a lot of these things that you can't really rely on for accurate information, but if you search, you'll find things like uh, the Mayo Clinic website, University of Maryland website, Sloan Kettering Memorial website, um, uh, WebMD website. There are some very reliable, trustable websites that have good impartial information on, on the herbs, uh, but you're going to have to do some searching or talk with your integrative medicine practitioner about what the high quality manufacturers are because herbs and supplements are a highly unregulated industry and uh, there can be adulterants and contaminants in them. The doses can be all over the place. There is uh, there was recently a study in New York State that showed some just very troubling results with uh, some nutritional supplements where they, they had almost nothing, none of what they said they had in it or they have things that shouldn't be in there. You have to use good manufacturers that pay attention to good manufacturing products and so you may need some expert assistance with that. Sleep medications I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because uh, that's usually what you'll get from a doctor, the, uh, the benzodiazepines. They can work very well. That's at least for a short time. They tend to lose their effectiveness the more you take them. So they're more effective if you just take them once in a while to kind of break up a stretch where your sleep really isn't very good and have one or two nights of good sleep and then go let your body work it out from there. That's how they work the best. If you start taking them every night, they start to lose their effectiveness. You might need to take a higher dose, and then you get habituated to them. The other risks involved with benzodiazepines is that they tend to be pretty highly addictive, and if you have any kind of addictive tendency, benzos are substances that people tend to get hooked on. They can cause memory loss. In the short term, they definitely cause memory loss, and they can accumulate. And in older people, and a lot of older people are on these, they make the risk of falling, breaking a bone, or hitting your head, you know, uh, much, much more likely. And that's a big, big cause of mortality in older people is tripping and falling because they're sedated at night. They might, if, they're, if you're on a blood thinner and you hit your head, kiss it goodbye. Um, you know, we are going to go from something, but that's a preventable cause of death and you want to be careful about those medications. Uh, antidepressants are used for sleep and if, if you are depressed and we normalize your, ser your serotonin levels and your other neurotransmitter levels, you will sleep better. Those are probably better choices, but they're, again, not sleeping pills. They're things you need to take on a regular basis. 
So try the natural things first. They're much safer. And when they work, they're not doing you harm and save the medications. And there's a dozen other medications. They all have the same kind of risks associated with them. So try the natural things first. The last thing I'm going to mention is guided imagery. Um, the Healing Mind did a cooperative study with one of the largest physician groups in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm from, Hill Physicians Medical Group. It was a randomized study. It was a pilot study. We had about 110 people. Um, they all had primary insomnia. And we gave them a sleep hygiene brochure that explained all the things I explained to you about sleep hygiene versus a guided imagery CD that uh, did talk to them about sleep hygiene but also led them through some guided imagery relaxation and suggestion practices. And uh, we did it for four weeks and followed up. And we checked out how easy it was for them to fall asleep, how many times did they wake up at night, uh, how restful, rested did they feel in the morning, and how many sleeping pills or sleep aids did they use. And uh, both the brochure, just the sleep hygiene helped, but the CD helped quite a bit more, significantly more. And it helped people fall asleep faster. They didn't wake up as much. They took fewer sleeping aids and sleeping pills. And the interesting finding was that whether or not it helped them fall asleep faster or they slept longer, people felt more rested in the morning. A huge difference. They felt like five times more rested when they did the guided imagery CD. We found that, you know, practice makes perfect. If, um, if people didn't do it, it didn't help them. If they listened to it one time, they improved their sleep score significantly. If they listened to it up to five times, they tripled the response. If they listened to it 10 times, they had six times better a response. And it's sort of leveled out once you've listened to it about 10 times. We're talking 25 minutes, 10 times. You learn something, you learn how to relax, and your brain learns how to put you back to sleep. That's really what you want to do is just learn again to sleep. Most of you have slept well at some point in your life. You just sort of forgot how to do it because everything else got in the way. The good news is you can learn how to put yourself back to sleep again. So thank you for listening. This is Dr. Marty Rossman for The Healing Mind.